What's going on, y'all? We are back. The RFA podcast is here. We are in the building, and we're back once again to talk to you all, independent artists, um, DJs, creatives, about everything in the world of digital marketing, um, become, becoming a better independent artist, all of those type of things, man. So we thought it would be dope to bring on a really, really dope guest. Um, he goes by the name of DJ Dramos. He is a producer, a DJ, a podcaster. He produces The Breakfast Club along with a number of other podcasts, and he is on fire <laughs> right now. Um, DJ Dramos. What's up? What's up, fam? How are you doing? Man, doing great, man. Doing great. Thank you for joining us today, man. It's really, of course. Thank it's you really for awesome me. to have you. So, you know, the way we do it, Dramos, typically, like, on these, on these podcasts, we have a bunch of independent artists and producers mm-hmm. and things like that. So we thought it would be really dope to bring you on here and, and you know, discuss your journey, um, mm-hmm. any tidbits of information that you could give to independent artists and producers that are just kind of getting started with this thing, any words of advice, because you are obviously making moves right now. You're doing a lot of really dope things, man. Can you just jump right in, man? Can you go into like your journey and how you've gotten to this point so far? Can you kind of give us a background on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the the short story version of it is, um, I mean, I've been chasing a, a career in music for a very long time, man. Uh, you know, I used to play in bands and then I used to tour around the country with that. And when that ended, I started DJing and, and producing music and well, attempting to produce music at that time. Um, and, and all that just kind of, you know, as you know, when you start doing things, you start meeting people and that starts leading into two different things. And through DJing, I just started meeting different people on radio. Um, and that just kind of kept snowballing into different opportunities. And this was, I mean, over the course of a few years, but as those relationships started to, to develop and as people got to know me, you know, opportunities started to come about and that's kind of how I got my foot in the door on radio. Um, and then a few years into that of, of working for iHeartRadio, I used to do the um, like overnight shift, basically running the boards that eventually led into like an opening at the Breakfast Club. And, and you know, kind of fast forward a couple of years, that's uh, to where you guys see me right now. Mm, that's dope, man. That's dope. So essentially what you did was take advantage of opportunities. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and and one thing that we always tell tell our audience is to stay ready so you don't got to get ready. So mm-hmm. obviously for you, you've had this career in the music industry, even before the whole Breakfast Club thing took mm-hmm. off, you've had this career. So when the, when your name was called upon, you were ready to just get it and go, right? Pretty much? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, all of it that led up to the Breakfast Club was like my life experience that like allowed me to really seize this moment, you know? Um, there have been other people before me that have sat in that chair with my same job over the course of the 10 years that the Breakfast Club has, but you know, I don't, I don't think they've, you know, uh, if it's been their goal or not, but I've taken advantage of it in a different way than I think anybody else has sitting in that seat, you know? So yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, the education process that came with all the other life experience that I had chasing this goal. And also, you know, like you're saying, staying ready. I'm, I always used to, you know, watch interviews from other artists and listen to platforms like this to try and gain knowledge and, and apply it to what I can, you know, do for myself. So that all led up to me being able to take advantage of an opportunity when it came about, you know? That's huge because I, I um you know I can I can relate to that as well because I used to intern at a studio and I ended up getting a tour managing job nice. um, with a, with an EDM artist um, mm-hmm. from an intern and it was all because of like different skill sets I had right it's like mm-hmm. you gotta like be able to skill yourself up man like stack skill sets up and and you never know like where that might get you in like Absolutely. what were some of the skill sets that you feel like are are really important for, for people to have, or even like a skill set that you feel like really kind of helped you take full advantage of these situations? Um, I mean, I think first and foremost, it was just like saying yes to everything. You know, I think I, I wasn't above doing anything that was asked of me, you know what I mean? And I think that, you know, when people in positions of power started seeing that I was willing to kind of do whatever, even if it was something stupid, like I'm talking about even in a social setting, like, um, if I was going to like a party that I was invited to by one of like the industry people I met, I had no problem going and make, like, making the ice run, you know what I mean? Going in the bags of ice or like stupid stuff like that, you know, like, but I think that just displayed the level of my character, you know what I mean? That, uh, you know, that I didn't care. I didn't, you know, ask for something to be in it for me. I was just there to kind of be a part of what was going on. Um, and that led to the trust of people, you know, offering me opportunities and things like that. Um, and also, I think coming from the side of being in a band, I, you know, when it comes to like, bands and and especially like you know rock music and things like that like a brand has always been a thing for them you know what i mean an image has always been a thing in that world so when i became a dj that it was still very new i mean you you talk about uh 
you know, uh, working for an EDM artist, I came up under that era when that EDM stuff was booming. And the thing I noticed about a lot of them was they didn't have the branding stuff down. You know what I mean? Like it, there was no cohesive branding. They just looked like regular dudes walking around, you know, there wasn't anything super interesting about them. So when I came into like that whole scene of DJing and this and that, I took what I learned in the band world of like, I have to have a cohesive image from the way that I dress to the way my photos look to the way my logo is that everything kind of lends itself, you know, in, into one another. And that's kind of some of the things that I took with me going into this world. That's dope. So for you right now, obviously, since you're since you're on such a huge platform, have you been able to to see that reap the benefits in your DJ career? You know, have you have you been able to see? And I'm not just talking about like plugs or anything like that, but just the way that radio operates in general. Have you been able to utilize that knowledge and kind of infuse that into your music career as well? And if so, um, what kind of things have you done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you you see how it works in radio. You know what I mean? And and then you kind of see. You know, I, what I think the biggest facade a lot of artists have is that they need radio to be successful, you know, um, and being in radio and seeing firsthand the process that goes into these records being added to radio, you know, you realize that the majority of independent artists, 99.999% of them are not ready to make that leap into radio. And, and even if their song gets played, it really doesn't mean anything aside from like it, you know, being a stroke of your ego. You know, uh, where because I've been privy to being in some of those meetings with the label heads and the program, you know, directors, because I'm also a DJ on the radio. So, you know, you see them coming up with the information like, oh, we're streaming this much on Spotify or Shazam numbers of this, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, oh, there's a story as to why these artists are being played. You know what I mean? And I think that that's like one of the big things I see a lot of independent artists miss is like they want to jump ahead into being on the radio and they think that's where they should be focusing all their energy and the reality is you don't have the money that a major label has behind you and chances are you probably don't have the buzz that these artists have to justify them taking a chance on your record you know right and yo that actually you you brought up a good point as far as streaming goes because that was going to be my next question um mm -hmm. radio versus streaming which one do you mm -hmm. feel is more beneficial for an independent artist um and, and kind of sticking with that whole whole streaming thing are you seeing that when when records get added to radio they're looking directly at, at streams for that or are there a couple other metrics that they look at i mean there are a few things but i think streaming numbers is definitely gigantic for them um obviously now TikTok is another big thing uh, i you know you'll notice um especially in like the pop world like a lot of the the records that are being added are ones that are like the viral songs on TikTok. you know um and, and definitely in the hip-hop i mean you know the baby with rockstar and things like that or, or doja cat um, you know, those, those songs were TikTok records, uh, you know, aside from the baby already being a gigantic artist, but mm -hmm. you know, things like that. I mean, they're always developing with the new technology. It always adds to the story, you know, uh, Shazam, when that was like a bigger thing, they would be like, Oh, it's Shazamming this much in New York city. So this is why you should be thinking about adding it to the radio in New York city. Um, so yeah, they're definitely looking at all that stuff. I mean, they have some sort of old metrics as well that they use as far as like call outs where they call random people and like, see what they think about the hook and verse of this song. Um, but it really is a combination of a lot of a lot of those things and sometimes even like little things like oh and they're going to be on tour with you know this gigantic artist so you know they're probably going to reap the benefits of that as well so little things like that but definitely streaming numbers are, are gigantic right now when they're you know kind of telling the story as to why an artist deserves one of those limited spots in radio mm -hmm. for sure so so for you like like with us we're a digital marketing platform so obviously like our whole goal is to empower the artists to to understand that streams aren't necessarily everything you know what i'm saying um there's a lot of we call them vanity metrics obviously mm -hmm. you've heard of those vanity metrics before um so from your point of view and we asked we've asked a couple people this on the podcast from your point of view do the vanity metrics really matter that much mm -hmm. i mean i don't think the vanity metrics i, I like that phrasing i don't think that those uh lead you to having a successful career necessarily you know um there are a lot of artists who can't sell tickets you know at all and have crazy streaming numbers you know um we especially see that in like the edm world like these guys have wild numbers but don't play anywhere you know um right. and and i think russ was talking about this recently you know the, the problem is that you know because streaming numbers became such a sort of uh, litmus test for why and the success of an artist, let's say, or justifying why an artist should get a radio spot, let's say. Um, 
that led to a lot of inflated numbers. Like you could buy streaming numbers on Spotify if you really wanted to, you know, and, and all those things. So yeah, I mean, you know, I think you definitely want it for the look because people are going to look at it. You know what I mean? I, I can't say that it, the numbers aren't glanced at. It is a nice thing to be able to talk about. But if you're talking about really building a tangible career and, and one that you can actually legitimately make money off of, then no, like the streaming numbers aren't the be all end all for you. They're just like a really good kind of launching pad for you, but they don't really necessarily mean you have an actual fan base that's going to go out and support what you do and you can go, you know, tour around the world and then sell hard tickets. Yeah, that's literally probably the, the moral of our story that we basically, you know, preach to our community um, time and time again, man. It's like, listen, you know, you can have all this engagement and all this shit, man. But at the end of the day, man, engagement does not pay the bills. At the right. end of the day, what you need to do is build a real fan base of people that are real fans that really rock with what you're doing. Um, yeah. Owning your data and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure you guys at the radio station are collecting all types of data um, and doing yeah. all types of stuff with that, right? Yeah, I mean, you're you're definitely like, you know, when we have the app now, like the iHeartRadio app, and the big thing is obviously you want people to sign up for that so they're invested in that app, and it, it you know, lends itself to them being able to consume all your other content. You know, iHeartRadio has different podcasts, and, and you can stream all of our radio stations from around the country via the app, no matter where you are. So, yeah, obviously, that is like a tangible thing, being able to get a user to, to be invested in, like, your platform so that you can send them content and things like that. And it's the same thing, I think, even as an artist with social media. It's like, how many artists do you know have, you know, whatever, 200,000 followers on, like, Instagram, but, like, do they really, you know, have 200,000 people supporting their stuff? You know, there's people that I know that have legitimate, like, you know, 10, 15,000 followers on there, but they're real highly engaged followers and they're moving merch. You know what I mean? They have people supporting them and that's way more important than having some sort of completed number when you have legitimate people supporting you, you know? Way more, way more yeah. important. Like we literally went around the whole entire country, like speaking about this stuff uh, with a producer named Cato and he did something called sound advice tour. We basically went around the whole country and we're speaking to thousands of artists, man. And like, when yeah. we start talking about stuff because i don't know how much you know about it but we we learned all of our digital marketing stuff from building e-commerce stores hmm. so we had a decent amount of success building e-commerce stores yeah. and then once we kind of had success there we took the knowledge that we had built from there and basically transferred it over to our music and ended up packing out some shows and ended up doing tours and all that kind of stuff so our our mind frame and our perspective of running ads is so completely different now mm -hmm. so when we're telling we're talking to artists about you know asking them, you know, do you know what a Facebook pixel is? Or, you know, are you guys building email lists? Are you getting mm -hmm. text messages? Are you getting phone numbers? Are you getting these things? I mean, bro, it's like literally going over their head. Like, it's just right. like, nobody knows shit, man. And I think it's yeah. such a, it's such a huge problem for, mm -hmm. for independent artists. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of people just get caught up and I love that, the vanity metrics type of thing, you know? Um, and it, it really means nothing at the end of the day. I mean, even if you look at the way like influencer marketing has changed, you know, they're looking at a lot of your back end and seeing like how interactive are the people that are following you are, you know what I mean? Like for a while, they're just throwing money at anybody who had a good amount of followers on there. But now like they want to see results. They're tracking, you know, how many people actually are fucking with your content, like who's commenting on your stuff, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, and that's not, that doesn't necessarily mean you have the most followers, but if you have like a rabid group of 20,000 people following you, that's gigantic because they're really getting a lot of value out of that, you know? For sure. And I think, you know, for the artists that are listening right now, pay attention to this because the vanity metrics, the vanity metrics aren't going to do much for your career. And we always say it like this, like you can get the most streams in the world. You can do a million streams. Like I've seen, I've literally seen ads where you can pay somebody like a hundred dollars to get like yeah. 200,000 streams. Like I've mm -hmm. seen it with my own eyes, but that yeah. doesn't mean that you can convert those streams into real fans. And that's yep. the whole issue with, you know, Spotify and some of these others is that, I mean, it's good for the user. They don't really give up a lot of data for the user. But for us as marketers, we don't necessarily know who those people are. So right. whereas if you're using like Facebook ads or um, Instagram ads or even, you know, Google ads, YouTube ads, you know who your customer is. Facebook has yep. 52,000 data points on yeah. each person using it. So they know exactly what it is that you're doing. And that's great for us as marketers. It might suck for you when they're listening to your phone conversations. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? It, it's good for good for us as marketers. So independent yeah. artists need to get out of the mindset of, of thinking that just streams will save them because it's a little more than streams. Um, yeah. Yes, streams are good, but like you alluded to, man, 
uh, that's not going to pack out a show. That's, right. that's definitely not going to I think even, you know, to be honest, and I say this as a person who works in radio, I think radio is a bit of a vanity metric. You know what I mean? Because look at somebody like a Russ who just up until recently really had like real, a ra real radio song, you know. But the dude was selling out arenas around the country based, you know, just upon his like Internet success and a, and a rabid fan base built on there with zero to, to no, um, you know, uh, inter I'm sorry, uh, radio support, you know. So you look at somebody like that, it's like, that's what you should be focusing on. Like the whole idea behind something like radio is really what pushes you over the edge into becoming a superstar. It's not what makes your career anymore. It is what makes you, you know, go to that next level of being an actual superstar and, and you know, blowing up in a larger way, but you don't necessarily need it to be successful and it shouldn't be the way you gauge your own success either. That's facts, man. And I don't know if you do you follow Russ on IG? Did you see his post, his latest post where he was showing his numbers yeah. for mm -hmm. from TuneCore? Whew. Yeah. yeah. That's just crazy. crazy. That is crazy. I mean, at the end of the day, like what he's doing is the smart way to do it because he's obviously he has a shit ton of content and a, a yeah. lot of a lot of music. His mm -hmm. his actual catalog is pretty extensive. But yeah. he's like he's re-engaging his fans, right? He's yes. he's giving people, he's bringing people in to like he's showing them, you know, he's showing everybody his new dog that he's got. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's like bringing them into the world, right? And that's mm -hmm. so important, man, like giving people like that behind the story, uh, behind the scenes. And even what yeah. you're doing, like on your page, where you're giving a lot of value, bro. Um, just mm -hmm. giving a lot of value and building your stuff there. Um, are you are you running any Facebook ads or anything like that? Are you pay, uh, doing any paid traffic? No, I mean, I'll, I've done some Instagram ads before um as far as like promoting some of the clips that i had when i was doing like the the daily ig show and things like that um but for the most part man it's just been super organic to be honest with you you know I, it's been a lot of things like this you know i'm always open to going on people's platforms and and using right. kind of cross promoting the breakfast club stuff and things like that um i personally haven't really really de delved into you know doing a lot of the ads which i know is something that you know i should probably start looking into it's definitely something i'm interested in but um but yeah, I haven't I haven't really messed with it too much to be honest. Yeah, because I, I I look at your you know your profile and your your community that you're building. Like you actually have like if you've never even ran, bro, you're like probably sitting on like some gold right now that you don't even know, like some data, right? Um, that you could tap into, right, and just basically extract that data and then leverage that data to start going out and getting a shit ton more fans, um, and kind of building it up even faster, and probably not even really using that big of a budget. To yeah. be honest with you, because you've been doing it for a while and you probably have a lot of data on there. Um, like, do you, you understand like what the Facebook pixel is and how all that kind of stuff works or no? No, I mean, I never really delved into it. I mean, I know the Facebook like ads are obviously super, you, it, the great thing about them is you can get really like hone in on specific niches and like really gain a lot of information when it comes to running and stuff. But to be honest with you, man, I've never really like delved into the looking into it super hardcore. Bro, I'll, I'll just give you some sauce, man. I mean, shit, you're on here, bro. Yeah, yeah cause I want to see you like take your shit and do something with it. Um, this is it, man. I'm, so, I'm down. I'm always down to learn something new. Yeah, man. So like the Facebook pixel is pretty much like a piece of code, right? That you put on your website, and, and basically what that what it what it does is it tracks all the behavior on your website, right? So anytime, like let's say you have an e-commerce store, um, yeah. someone if someone adds something to a cart, or they initiate a uh, checkout, or they purchase something. This pixel, what it does is it takes that information and it sends it over to your ads manager for mm -hmm. you to analyze, right? As a marketer, and now you can basically see exactly what's happening on your website and you can see which ads are getting you the purchases and which ones are, are wasting you money, right? Mm -hmm. So this pixel, it collects all this data and what this pixel is so crazy, bro. It's like a living creature. It's fucking crazy how it is yeah. because it like learns, like the more money you spend, like the more it learns who your audience is and, and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, it learns and it goes out and starts giving you better results the, the more you go. That's huge. Um, but what I want to tell you is, is that um, the pixel is also, it's natively on your profiles, on Facebook profile and your Instagram profile, hmm. right? So like, for instance, right now, you've been running ads, or not running ads, but you've been posting stuff and people have been engaging with your videos, commenting, liking, watching, you, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the Facebook pixel is also gathering information on all those people as well, right? So what you can do is you can go on there and you can create something. Have you ever, have you ever heard of a custom audience? Yeah. So you can go on there, you can create a custom audience of people who have engaged with your Instagram profile, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then you can take that custom audience and you can load it up into Facebook and then you can create something called a lookalike audience. Have you ever heard of a lookalike? No, I mean, I get the, I guess the concept of it from the name, but yeah. Yeah, man, it's fucking crazy, dude. That's so actually you, wild that, that even, that that's a thing that it lets you copy it like that. Yeah, man, you can literally like just upload the custom audience of people who have already proven that right. they, they rock with the content that you have. And then you can tell, tell Facebook, hey, go find me like 2 million more people or 10 more million more people that are just like this. Yeah, based off of data, right? Based off of yeah. their use of data. And then you can start targeting those lookalike audiences and go out and start getting crazy results with a really small number, bro. You should do that shit like tonight, bro. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm inspired, man. I, I, I focus. I'm definitely looking into all this shit now that you're, you're telling me. That. I'm definitely inspired by that. You do. I mean, it's, just like, it's just like basically putting like gas on your fire because you already got a flame going, bro. Mm -hmm, right. You know what I mean? So what, what does it hurt to just throw a little extra gas on it you know what I mean? Um, and even if it's just promoting to your organic audience, because you know how the algorithm is, man, they're only showing right. your shit to like five or 10% of right. your actual following. So, you know, put a little bit of ads, but if you got it behind it, so you can get it to more people, um, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Nah, that's fire. I appreciate the, those, that advice right there. That's good. That's good information. Yeah. Especially for you, bro, since you do have, have so much traffic, you are, you are a DJ, you are doing all these other things. I know you also have like a vintage clothes, um ig as well so mm -hmm. i think it's really important for artists to have other things outside of just being an artist or being a dj or being a rapper so for you yeah. um i've, I've been pe like i said i've been checking you out for the past seven eight months now and i've been seeing that you're putting yourself out there as more than just a dj right mm -hmm. so for artists that are listening right now you know mm -hmm. What are some creative, other creative ways that artists can put themselves out there that you know of without having to just say, I'm a rapper? Because honestly, there's millions of people that rap. There's millions right. of people that produce. There's millions of DJs, you know. But for you, based off of what you've seen, maybe not even for yourself, but from other people, what would you say are some, some cool ideas that an artist can kind of implement into their brand to bring more people into their world and show people and fans, yo, I'm not just an artist. I do all these other things, which adds to the allure of being an artist. Yo, music artists and producers, listen, I don't know if you guys know this, but there are 2.4 billion active users on Facebook and Instagram every single month, okay? Active users, that is a massive potential fan base for you guys to tap into, okay? And you don't even have to leave the house in order to reach these people. You can do it from your couch, all right, from a laptop. There's no excuses, but you gotta get started, you gotta get in the game, you gotta learn how these ad platforms work. Okay, it's not rocket science, but you gotta get started, okay? We have a seven step blueprint that we put together. All right, it's seven steps. And by the end of these seven steps, you're gonna be launched and you're gonna be ready and starting to launch ads and finding new fans, okay? So click the link below, get our seven step blueprint. It's gonna help you, it's absolutely free. There's no excuses. You gotta get in the game, okay? Traditional marketing is out the window. Digital marketing is the new wave. You gotta learn how to do it, okay? Click the link below, let's get started. I think first and foremost for me, I always follow like, I guess I read in like a business book, whatever it was, but the idea of like, you have to have seven streams of income, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I subscribe to that and I don't even look at it necessarily as just streams, like seven streams of income. I also look at it as like ways to make myself more interesting. You know what I mean? Like to, you know, seven ways to create a world within what I'm doing, you know what I'm saying? And I think that that's what a lot of artists fall short on, you know, because it, it, it will get boring after a while if let's say you're a rapper and ev all your content is just you rapping and your music and you're trying to push people on that, you know? People want, you know, to, to feel like they're following a person. They want to feel like they're friends with you. They don't want to feel like they're just your fan, you know? Um, and I, I think that it, I would challenge anybody to kind of think of what comes to you naturally. Like me, I love like vintage clothing. That's my normal thing. So, you, you know, I, I open up about that. You know, that's something I'm always shopping. I always, you know, am posting clothing and things like that. So that opens people up and that people were like, oh, damn, that's like fire. That gives another conversation point, you know, um, like I, I didn't my Instagram. If you look at it, especially like pre quarantine, like I also would do like, you know, like outfit, you know, uh, photo shoots, basically, you know what I'm saying? Almost like uh, you would see an influencer or something like that doing, you know, and it, it, it takes you outside of me just trying to sell you as a DJ or a personality or whatever the case What is, you know, I'm giving you a multifaceted person to attach yourself to. So, you know, let's say in the case of, you know, we were talking about Russ, he also produces his own music. So like, I've seen him put out 
videos on YouTube of him producing the tracks. And like, that's interesting, you know, because then that, that lends a, a different per, you know, point of your personality, things like that, you know, um, or, or, or anything like that. Like any, anything that's extra, like, what are you super into? It has to be like a real thing. It can't, you can't just make some, something up, you know, um, and expect people to kind of latch on to it. But it's like, you know, I think keeping people interesting, allowing to have like a multi-level brand that they can really, you know, attach themselves to, you know, it's like, what is Nike? Nike is not just a clothing brand. They're selling you a lifestyle. You know what I mean? So like they're selling you a lifestyle of being active, you know, just do it. They're encouraging you to go out there and do things, you know? So that's what you're really buying into when you're buying into like a Nike, you're buying into all the athletes that they sponsor and this and that. So as a artist, you have to look at your brand in that way. Like, if all you're doing is trying to sell somebody your music, you're trying to sell them a t-shirt, like it's going to get old after a while. You know what I mean? There is no substance there, but like let, let them in on your life a little bit, you know? And, and obviously there's different levels of comfort and things like that. But you know, some people are really good at vlogging and, and things like that. And that helps lead to people messing with them. You know, um, somebody like a, like Guap dad has like really good YouTube content and it makes him interesting. And for some people they discovered him via that. And then they started listening to his music, you know? So, anything like that like you're really giving people avenues to to find you that in a non-traditional way because music is very crowded there's a million and one rappers there's a million and one djs producers you know you name it but if you can have them find you in a different way and then it's like oh shit he's also a rapper now they're more inclined to check that out you know um even you know the last example i would be like a nipsey hustle like i i don't even have to be a fan of nipsey's music to be a fan of him because i can watch his content and his interviews and all those things and like you know it, to me it's like watching a gary v almost you know but it's like somebody that speaks you know to to the culture that i i enjoy as well so like things like that man it's like you know they allow yourself to be extended just beyond just being whatever you're supposed to be whether it's a rapper or whatever the case may be bro that's gold man like all y'all listening right now and i say this a lot but, but y'all need to rewind that shit right there and watch that <laughs> again because that was literally gold right there and and even it's like the like if you want to invite people into your house and you only got one door well mm -hmm. then like you're limiting your chances why don't you make a couple of different doors let people right. come in from different places and, and come in and see you know what you got going on bro like it's the biggest thing artists and producers listen stop being so damn uh sheltered They're, you know like artists and producers they don't want to let people in yeah. but y'all got interesting things like Y'all can be like, obviously you're a music artist or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, that's great. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's important. But like, what if you're like, you know, an in living color, like fanatic, right? right? Like you just collect in living color fucking posters or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Now mm -hmm. all of a sudden there's a new element. And then like add on one, maybe you're a chef as well. Maybe you just love right. to cook. So now all of a sudden you're an artist and you're an in living color fanatic and you're a chef. Now mm -hmm. that's some interesting shit. I'm going right. to follow that. You yeah. know what I'm saying? That's the difference between rapping and, and building a real brand. You know yeah, what I mean? Absolutely. So. That's for sure. And I think I think a lot of um, a lot of independent artists, especially the ones that we talk to on the phone, because we talk to, you know, at least thirty to forty every month. Um, a lot of them are caught in the mindset that they they just need a rap. They just need to be producing more more rap content. Mm -hmm. You know, so I so I'm always on the phone with them. Like, yo, think about it a little bit differently. Think about it like, yo, I'm bringing these people into my world, but they don't just want to see me on a mic. And Guap Dad is a perfect example of that because he's so creative with his with the way he releases things, with the mm -hmm. type of content he has. Um, really engaging content because we always say it like we can have the best ad strategy in the world for you but mm -hmm. if your content isn't engaging you know you're not going to get your desired results it's just not going to happen you know at all so you know with that being said definitely artists pay attention to that because that's something that we find more and more this is going to separate you from the 99 percent of other artists that are just sitting here grabbing the mic and rapping exclusive right. behind the scenes uh studio footage of me creating my album like people don't want to see that no more you know so yeah. it's, it's definitely about um you know being creative man you know yeah i mean yeah. look even at odd future is another example of that like they sold you a lifestyle you know what i mean like do i mess with all of their music now nah, but like i was following what they were doing because it was interesting and like they had the merch and they were just like these like suburban you know black kids that skated and like broke all kinds of stereotypes of what you'd expect rappers to be and where they grew up from you know what i'm saying it was like interesting so that like sold people on them beyond even just the music in itself you know so um that's just you know brock hampton is another another example of that kind of stuff like they sold you on a lifestyle that they were living you know 
uh, and that really brought you into their world. And not everybody is going to mess with, you know, the music that, that they see when they're br you're bringing them in in a different way. But you can still retain a large portion of that audience when, you, when you know, some of them are going to end up messing with it and they came in an unorthodox way, you know? That's crazy. Yeah, that's so true, man, because I really don't even rock with Odd Futures music like that. Right. <laughs> but, like, I mean, some of, it, some of it's cool, but, like, right. I don't really ride around listening to it, but I love their brand. I love what they're doing right. there. And their merch is crazy. Right. Like, we all know who they are. You know what I mean? Like we've all yeah. seen the stuff. So that's like, that's the thing. It's like, even if I don't, I can't name a bunch of music from, from like them, but I know a lot about them more than I probably should for somebody who's not necessarily a fan of their music, you know? So that's the thing about it. They created a solid brand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For sure, man. So oh, go ahead, Flex, go ahead. Uh, yeah. I was just curious, too, like just sticking with the digital marketing thing too. Cause that's, it's just like so interesting how, brands are doing it nowadays so they even like a like a brand like the breakfast club or like the radio mm -hmm. station that you're, that you're at like is digital marketing a pretty big um platform or or or, or um is it a pretty big like tactic for you guys or you guys have digital marketing teams that are doing stuff or what's that look like for you um i mean there's there's definitely a focus on the youtube you know um that's a huge part of the show you know there's not necessarily like a digital marketing team who's like feeding the machine with ads or anything like that just as at this point, it's already pretty established. But um, I mean, there are a lot of people in the world who don't even realize it's an actual radio show that airs every morning. They just think it's a YouTube show or they think it's a podcast, you know, and that's like all around the world. So that tells you, you know, how important that YouTube audience is, how important their podcast audience is. And, you know, when the Breakfast Club first started almost 10 years ago, they were the underdogs. It was a brand new radio station, um, you know, that, that didn't have name recognition in New York. And they were, you know, no, so, you know, for the most part, aside from DJ Envy, you know, kind of no names within that space for the most part. Um, so they relied heavily on the blogs at the time. So they had relationships with the blogs and they would send, they would push their content out to all of those digital blogs and the blogs would repost it. And that's how a lot of that traction started getting on the Breakfast Club, especially on a national level. So, I mean, they've always embraced it, you know, the digital marketing. This was just like the early days when the blogs were kind of running everything, you know? Yeah, I think... Honestly, y'all were probably the second um, second online platform that I started rocking with heavy because I used to have a nine to five job, obviously. And I feel like a lot of a lot of your viewer base are people that are at work and listening mm -hmm. like while they're in the cubicle because that was me. Um, y'all and the Joe Budden podcast were like the first ones that I really started um, gravitating towards um, on a daily basis, man. And it's literally obviously taking on a life of its own, but this is sticking with the, sticking with the breakfast club. I know you're a producer for that. You're a producer for a couple of podcasts. So I know the schedule can be kind of rigorous, but I know a lot of people don't understand like the type of work that you really got to put in to make sure that everything is on point with all these shows that you're producing. So yeah. can you kind of go into what, what your day looks like? Like when does your day start? Can you kind of take everyone through what it's like? Yeah. I mean, I typically try to wake up around 3 a.m um every every weekday uh and then just kind of you know I, I probably don't have to but i like to give myself like an hour to just kind of like you know set my mind for the day uh and not like rush into my day um i get to the studio around 5 a.m and then with that it's just you know i control everything that's happening throughout the show so the mics the music the sound effects you know all the segments everything that's happening i'm recording that live and and being that we're nationally syndicated um you know it's almost 100 markets I'm basically controlling 100 radio stations, you know, at one time. So, um, you know, if I mess something up there, it messes everything up around the country, basically. So, you know, with, with that, it's just it's a it, it's a lot of pressure that comes along with it. But yeah, that, that's basically, you know, my role is I'm there on the fly live controlling everything, you know, as, as they're talking and doing their thing, just making sure the the show, you know, keeps running, stays on time and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Make sure you make, gotta make sure that you mute Charlemagne at the right time. Right, yeah, I gotta, I gotta duck the curses <laughs> if somebody uh, fucks up. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool, man. That's that's really dope, man. Really, really inspiring as well, man. What's next for for DJ Dramos, man? What do you got? New releases coming out? Where can people um, check you out and and, and kind of jump into your world? Yeah, man. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you, man. I appreciate the support. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm working on a mixtape right now, kind of wrapping that up. Um with basically just artists I've met via Instagram. So that's the, the cool thing about that. It's, I have been doing like a daily IG live. We were doing like an open mic via IG live twice a week on it. 
So majority of the artists that are going to be on this mixtape are all ones that I discovered to be the open mic I was doing. So, um, you know, com continuing to build that community aspect that we were talking about, you know, um, you know, giving back to the people that support me and, and collaborating in that way, giving them a platform, you know, is, is huge to me. So, th so that's one thing I'm working on right now. Um, and then I recently just launched like a digital late night show uh, called What the World Needs Now. We're doing that on the Breakfast Loves YouTube channel. So um, episode two dropped this last week. So it drops every single week uh, on the Breakfast Loves YouTube channel. So that's just like me talking about current events. Um, I integrate Instagram live into that. So I'm, you know, going back and forth with people in the comments and going live with people. And then I interview other people that are inspiring, that have stories to tell um, to kind of just, you know, put people in a good, uh, in a good headspace. That's dope, man. I'm definitely going to check that out, bro. And then as Thanks. far as like your project goes, do you have like a marketing strategy like built up for like your release? Like do you have you been collecting emails or, you know, all this kind of stuff for your release? Like let us know too, because if you get, we got ideas too, like if you need any help, bro, just feel free to let us know and we'll, we'll help you out as well. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, no, nah, I'm definitely down. I'm, I'll definitely hit, uh, you know, reach out to you guys. I like what, you know, where your head is at and, and you're thinking about things in a way that I'm not necessarily thinking about, which is, you know, as soon as you meet people like that, that's when you should start attaching yourself to it. You know, um, I have my own set of expertise or talents and I have my own, you know, things that I lack as well. So I'm big on partnering up with people who, you know, can, can help build me back up when it comes to those things, you know, so I'll definitely. Of course, that's, yeah. shit. that's everybody, man. That's everybody. Absolutely. All the smart people know that, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, listen, I have like, like my business partner basically is like a kid that hit me up to try to take pictures, you know, who was a photog aspiring photographer. And now, you know, he's like become a really dope graphic designer and video editor. And, all, and now he's the one who does the behind the scenes thing of the show on the Breakfast Clubs YouTube channel and like all that stuff. So like, it's all about collaboration, you know what I mean? And, and, and finding people who, uh, you know, are, are good at things you're not good at, you know, and that's like the, the main thing. So I definitely would love to collab with you guys on, on, uh, on all that kind of stuff as well, you know? Yeah, let us know, man. Cause I mean, it's, it's, it's really fun to just like create something and watch it blow up. Like it's, it's yeah. super, super fun for us too. And, and the biggest thing that I'll tell you right now just is like, bro, just try to collect as much data as you can. Like, so that, cause the thing is, is like, we all, like we spend all this time and energy building, uh, following on a certain platform, but what if that platform dissolves Then your, your entire following and all that time and energy dissolves too. So right. You have their data though. You have emails, you have phone numbers, you have many chat, like, you know, subscribers on your messenger bot or whatever it might be. Um, if you have those things, you can easily just move on to the next thing, whether it be TikTok or fucking right. schmick schmack, whatever's the next <laughs> thing, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. so, so definitely like, you know, I would say like do some kind of pre-release, man, and, and, and kind of get people hyped up for it and, and have them. Are you collecting an email list at this point? Yeah, I mean, I've had like a, in the past, you know, things that I've collected email lists with or I done like the texting apps and things like that. So I have, you know, a list of numbers and things like that. People I've been communicating with. I mean, I could do a better job at it. I think like all of us could. But, um, you know, it's it's tough to manage when you're doing a million and one different things. But, yeah, I definitely what you're saying is is absolutely true. You know, especially when you talk about the algorithm algorithms of Instagram and things like that, like you're when you put something out there, it's not going to your entire audience, you know, so to be able to also have the opportunity to reach them via email or text and really get it seen by more eyeballs, obviously is hugely beneficial. Yeah, hundred percent. And even you can even take that email list and upload that into Facebook and create a custom audience from that and then run a small budget, like five bucks a day, bro, something small. And then yeah. now your, your five bucks a day is going to hit every single one of those people on that email list. Mm. Right. Because yeah. you have all that data as opposed to just posting it organically and and expecting like everyone to see it because they're not going to you know so that and that can really stunt the, the growth of your of your of your release man you know and that kind of yeah. that sucks when you put all this time and energy into a project and then it doesn't go anywhere that's like the worst thing yeah. in the world <laughs> yeah. and i it's 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 definitely yeah i mean i've had that happen before and or you know with other past things so that's definitely like it'll definitely mess you up man if you if you put all this time into the music and this and that and you throw it out there like nobody hears it you know uh, yeah, it's like the biggest smack in the fucking face. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, absolutely, man. And I, and I, I think also kind of, you know, I, one thing I do want to share that came to my mind when we were talking about sort of being multifaceted. Uh, and I just remember the story, but I was talking to, uh, you know, Brand Man Sean. Yeah. Um, so he was telling me this story, and it's actually something I applied, and I, I want to keep reminding people like how important this is. Like, uh, he talked about. Um, a rapper that basically ended up making a jingle for Spanx, you know, like the woman's uh, thing. So what he did, what that rapper did was he ended up finding the CEO of Spanx on Instagram 
and DM'd her this jingle. She ended up loving it and using it. And now he like got this whole ad campaign and money out of it because he took the initiative to try and put himself in a world that he wasn't even, you know, thought of him before. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's something I'm a gigantic Tommy Hilfiger fan. So I applied that same thing to finding, uh, Andy Hilfiger, who's the, the dude behind Tommy jeans, basically. Uh, and I, it ended up working. I ended up meeting Andy Hilfiger and like, you know, we we're now in contact for different things, but I basically just like did a, a fake Tommy, a vintage Tommy Hilfiger photo shoot that looked exactly like their ad campaigns, sent it to him. And like, we ended up having a meeting the next week. You know what I'm saying? And like that, that is like one of those things. And like that leads now to other relationships and you being able to do other things. So like artists just have to get really creative and put themselves in spaces where they're not expected to be because if you're in a room full of DJs, nobody wants to hear about you being a DJ. But if you're in a room full of accountants and you're a DJ, you end up being the most interesting person in the room at that point. You know, that's the mindset you have to have. That's, that's huge. huge. That's huge. And then, so that's a great idea. And then having basically the understanding of how the marketing aspect works. So that way, when that influx of traffic comes in, mm. you have the systems in place to capture the data, segment people based off what they're doing. Right. And, and honestly, a lot of this stuff can be automated. It doesn't really need to be as much work as, as I'm kind of making it seem like it is. Like <laughs> It's kind of like, it's all out of like a lot of front end work. Like once it's set up, now yeah. it's just there. And when the traffic comes in, everybody's getting segmented automatically retargeted and you got, you know, all this stuff going on. But, but what you just said was gold and then mixed with the understanding of how these systems work. Mm -hmm. And and then also having good fucking music, by the way. Right. Good content. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> That's I tend to sometimes forget to say, oh yeah, the shit's gotta be good though. Right, right, right. That's, that is the thing. I mean, that's also like, I guess, brings us full circle to like being ready at all times. You know what I'm saying? Like, you mm -hmm. can, you, you can't, like, there, like, I see this so much when it comes to like, there are some artists that are amazing networkers. Like somehow you're like, damn, like, have they got in the room with this person? They know this person, but they can never make it pop. And a lot of times it's because like the music or the product isn't there. You know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and this is probably a different conversation, but it's also being conscious of that and being like, hmm, maybe I should pivot. Or like, I always say like, there are some artists who are great at networking. They should be an artist manager because they can get an artist into the room. So if you can find an artist that has amazing talent, now put it together with your amazing networking. Now you actually have something, you know what I mean? So it's just, you know, there's so many obviously different levels to it, but that's just something that, you know, came to my head. So true. No, that's important. I think, I think a lot of the, cause here's the deal. Let me be completely transparent, bro. Like a lot of the artists that reach out to us are not that good. You know what I'm saying? And so I think that this will will hit their ears differently when they realize it, when they realize, yo, I'm not getting any engagement and I've tried running ads and nothing seems to be working, but I do happen to be good at this particular thing. Right. Like you said, pivot and you can literally take your career to the next level. Because even with us, in our opinion, we make dope music. Obviously, we're going to toot our own horn. But, you know, with us, we feel like we're dope artists, but we're also great digital marketers. And we've gotten amazing results over the years. So for us, it's like, yeah, okay, we do music. Our music's kind of EDM, R&B-ish, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Artists do that. But now when you couple that with the fact that we're digital marketers as well, now you can kind of maneuver yourself a little bit differently and get the attention of people that otherwise wouldn't have paid you no mind whatsoever. Absolutely. Um, you know, but there's a lot of gems that were just dropped in the last like 10 minutes just now. So <laughs> yeah. um, another thing that stuck out is artists definitely shoot your shot, though. Definitely mm -hmm. shoot your shot. Don't be afraid because honestly, the worst that's going to happen is they're not going to respond. Right. Yeah. That's pretty much the worst. Otherwise, if they do respond and they tell you no, at least you got a response. Still no, but yo, at least they responded to you. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. shoot your shot. Get creative. Don't just send red just stupid dm messages like yo right, that's what i was gonna say too yeah yeah Put you me know on. I, I hate that message uh let's work you know what i mean uh yeah. mind youtube link on instagram that you came and click it anyway so now you're just fucking sending me a random like <laughs> text for no reason like all that stuff like put some effort into it you know what i mean like even like make the person feel like you appreciate their work and they're more inclined to look at it like all it really takes is scrolling a couple feeds down on their instagram being like yo I saw your interview you did here. Love this thing about that. Then they're like, oh shit, this person actually has the time to like get to know what I'm doing. And they might be more inclined to, to like answer exactly. your, thing your music. You know, it's all, all things like that. Exactly, man. That's, that's artist etiquette 101 for y'all right. out there. Artist <laughs> etiquette 101. Um, 
But yo, I mean, yo, once again, bro, we appreciate your time, dog. Definitely. Uh, um, but other than that, Flex Boogie, you got anything else, man? Shit, yeah, man, I got so much, but I don't even want to waste. <laughs> I don't even want to do it, bro. I can talk for like another hour and shit. Bro. <laughs> I know this man's a busy man, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let him breathe. <laughs> for, sure. for sure, for sure. Well, yo, with that being said, this is the RFA podcast. Independent artists take action, take action, take action. Implement everything you're hearing on these on these podcasts, because literally, if you implement them, you can change the course of your career. With that being said, we out. Peace and love. Thank you.